All right, everyone. Well, it's uh, 7.03, and uh, <clears throat> I think people are going to continue to trickle in a little bit, but I don't want to keep people waiting too long, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to Skull Basics. This is our, our first session. Um, we hope is going to be uh, an exciting new uh, webinar series. This is also the Mayo Clinic uh, Neurosurgery Rochester Research Grand Rounds today. Uh, this is an outline of the talk we're going to go through this morning. We'll start with a couple quick acknowledgments and an introduction talk a bit about the overview of the series and who our target audience is here. Um, and then the sort of meat of things, we're gonna go through some basic skull-based principles. Uh, and we're gonna format that in this sort of six questions idea. And then we're gonna talk about how to learn to think like a skull-based surgeon and what that means. And we'll use a, a case example and a, a walkthrough of a dissection to, to get there. And then we're gonna wrap this up with a sort of a, a sneak peek of the next session. And then some information for the, the medical students on the line about the, uh, the Mayo, um, yeah, someone's asking me if this will be recorded. It will absolutely be recorded and posted. I'll get to that at the end, uh, both on our website and elsewhere, but thank you for that. Um, so anyway, let's get started. So uh, I have to start off with a thank you, or rather several thank yous. Um, these are you know, our department leaders here, uh, and you know, I'm gonna start by thanking Dr. Parney, our research chair. I wouldn't be giving this grand round this morning uh, without the invitation he so kindly extended me. Um, and none of the work that you're going to see today that our group has put together would have been possible without the amazing support and mentorship and leadership and, and really uh, absolute commitment to education from you know, the top down at our department, from our chair, Dr. Spinner, um, our enterprise chair and dean, Dr. Meyer, and then of course, um, you know, on a, a more personal and sort of intimate level, the, the fellowship director, uh, Dr. Link, and our program director and assistant fellowship director, Dr. Van Gombel. We're very privileged to train in this sort of environment. And you know, I'm at the end of a, a very long history, not even the end, I'm at the, the current moment of a very long history of uh, neurosurgery here at Mayo Clinic. And you see photos like these from the, the golden age, and it's very humbling to come into work every day and you know, think you, you wanna try and make even some tiny contribution that it measures up to you know, what the generation and generations before us were able to, to contribute here. And you know, I'm part of an amazing team um, both the you know sort of small team that, that put this research together and the big team of clinical neurosurgery here at Mayo and it's it's an absolute privilege to be a part of this department and to to continue advancing the the three shields of you know clinical work research and education here. Um, I need to give a special shout out, of course, to uh, you know Dr. Link, uh, my mentor, and Dr. Paraselda, who spent a year with us here a few years back. And uh, as many of you know her work, she's um, one of the last and and great Roten uh, fellows. She's been two years in his lab. She came here as a clinical skull-based fellow, but we really benefited from spending so much time with, with her and learning how to do those, you know, rote and style dissections. And um, it was one of the most, uh, you know, incredible experiences in my professional life. It, it's been such a privilege to, to work with her, to learn from her, and, and now to, you know, call her a friend and a mentor. So big thank you to Maria. None of this work would have been possible without her influence, which carries on. And then finally, my, my research partners, uh, Dr. Avital Perry, Dr. Lucas Carlstrom, my co-residents here, Avital just graduated. Um, Luke is one of the five. You'll hear more about him at the end. So, by and this is actually one of our another former skull-based fellow and a very dear friend of mine, Satoshi Kiyofuji. Um, none of this work it, it gets done if you're not having fun, or at least it doesn't get done well. And to have people who you know share the passion and excitement um, that really makes it uh, you know a pleasure to get out of bed every day and, and work on the the research and education aspect of things in addition to just you know doing your job and taking great care of patients. So I'm I'm grateful to have such good people I work with. And then who am I? Obviously, the people on the line from Mayo know me, but uh, those of you from the outside who are tuning in today, uh, I'm one of the sevens here. I'm the current infolded skull base fellow with Dr. Link and Dr. Van Gombel. Uh, next year, I'll be at Barrow for a year doing a vascular fellowship. And if you're here not because uh, of your connection with Mayo, then you probably uh, have come across me in some capacity in the sort of sphere of neurosurgical social media. I help out with a few of those accounts for a Journal of Neurosurgery, uh, Young Neurosurgeons Committee, and of course, the Skull Base Society, as well as my own uh, Twitter account. And a lot of you know, what I've, I've put together in those spaces and what I'm the most excited about that, that has kind of uh, been the thrust behind what we're going to talk about today is an interest in not neuroanatomy in particular, but not just anatomy, but sort of the education and simulation and pedagogy spaces and how we can you know, do better training ourselves, training the next generation of neurosurgeons and how we develop some new tools and resources in that regard. So what is Skull Basics? So this is uh, an educational webinar. The idea is to put together um, a series of talks on the sort of core concepts of skull-based surgery. And we're gonna talk general principles and cases, but I really like the idea of using approach selection as, as one of the best ways to teach the sort of ideas of skull-based surgery. 
and um, it brings together a lot of the different the anatomy principles, the human principles, the you know case principles, and so that's really the sort of um, you know the core focus of a lot of different things here. But we're gonna you know go a lot of different directions you know, in service of that goal. The the main target audience is of course junior residents. This group I'm particularly passionate about treat, uh, teaching, both on the neurosurgery and ENT side, but I'm also quite hopeful that this will be at least interesting and potentially educational for a lot of other groups, uh, senior residents and fellows, medical students, our uh, NP and PA colleagues, um, and maybe even some staff. And so then the last sort of disclaimer I have to issue here is that you know, nothing I'm going to say today is original. You know, I've, I've had uh, the privilege of learning from so many incredible mentors, some listed here, some not. Um, and every one of my mentors has their own you know, chain of, of amazing mentors who came before them. And you know, these, these ideas are, are what we learn every day when we you know, go to the OR, when we read, when we study. Um, I've read a lot of great books, too. I mean, Dr. Dr. Jean's book you see here is uh, and Dr. Meyer's book. Uh, and, you know, Dr. Tu's book, Dr. Lawton, but this is a selection of them, but, um, you know, these are, these have given me almost all the ideas I've had. And this is, uh, the point of this is really to synthesize what I've learned and to try to empower you to, to advance your own learning and, of course, to share my love of skull-based surgery. So, with all of that said, let's get cracking. Let's talk about some actual skull-based surgery here. And so I thought that sort of a fun, engaging, you know, lighthearted way to, to talk about this would be to use just the, the, the questions that we use when we encounter anything new in life, the, you know, the who, what, where, when, why, and to put those sort of uh, five basic questions in the service of the most important question, which is how do you learn skull-based surgery? And if you'll bear with me for a second, I'm going to ask for a little bit of help from a character you may recognize as Stella Poe from uh, Kung Fu Panda. And when I was a third year resident, one of our, our functional staff I was on his service and he asked me if I'd seen the movie. I said, no, I mean, he said, you gotta go home and watch it this weekend. And uh, I smiled and, you know, like a dutiful junior resident, went home, you know, pulled it up on Netflix with my, my son and watched it. And, um, you know, it has a lot of interesting lessons about uh, sort of both being a learner and being a teacher and how you can be at different stages of your evolution and inhabit both of those roles. And you can, um, you know, be someone who uh, is both, you know, trying to find your way and also teach other people to find their way at a slightly different phase of things. So rather than starting off with talking about the, the when of skull base and the honor of Poe, I want to talk about the Zen of skull base, by which I mean we all sort of start out a little bit unformed as a medical student or a junior resident and you've caught interest in skull base and you're really just you know thinking about anatomy all the time. And you know as the, the senior resident of the fellow trying to help someone in that position get their thoughts a little bit more organized and learn things a better, a bit better, you start thinking about approaches. And even that in its own way, it's still, it's still kind of rigid. And I'm, I'm trying to you know, grow beyond the idea of approaches and, and think in a little bit more um, higher level play. And like, you know, the, 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 uh, this is, you know, Shifu's teacher is this guy, Ugwe, in the movie. And you know, he's thinking about, you know, the sort of things our staff are thinking about, the master surgeons, about access and optimization, improvisation, the outcome for the patient. And you know, really, um, the the goal is not to think about it at all. The goal is to get to the point where, um, you know, you're just uh, thinking on an abstract level about, you know, I'm going to do this operation and help this patient. And that brings us to the most important who of skull-based surgery, which, as in so many things we do, particularly here at Mayo, you know, this is all about the patients and the needs of the patient always come first. And so, from a rigid perspective, you could say, well, you know, skull-based patients are uh, individuals with these extraaxial neoplasms or cerebrovascular diseases. But what I really want to emphasize is that these tend to be benign diseases that are quite complex and that have a challenging clinical course. And that means that there's a lot of risk of, of morbidity, of mortality, of recurrence. And so, the rule here is is multimodality treatment over many, many years. And that means patients tend to have a complex course. And they tend to have long-term relationships with their surgeons and their other doctors. And the fact that there isn't often a right plan um, complicates that even more, that there might be a spectrum of possible right options at any given moment. Um, and that you have to tune that to what they want, to what their medical status is, to a lot of other things. Uh, it, it opens the door for a lot of shared decision making. And you know, the, the patient is very much at the center of skull-based surgery. And that can mean everything from um, you know, factors like what are their deficits beforehand and are they deficits that you might be able to rehabilitate that would prompt you to choose one approach or uh, deficits, you know, like a hearing loss that you, you're not going to be able to necessarily rehabilitate and that would open the door to another. Um, have they had other treatments before they've gotten to you or would they be open to other treatments down the road or they really want to have a, as definitive a treatment now but that one that might, you know, have a different risk profile. And then of course, like any other surgical decision making, 
uh, things like age, medical fitness, and their social support network. And of course, their individual preferences and biases go into the decision making. There's another really important who in skull-based surgery, and that's, of course, the team. And one of the things that I love about skull-based surgery is that it's, it's multidisciplinary by default. You know, every operation tends to involve not just neurosurgeons, but also ENT or uh, plastic surgeons, ophthalmologists. And then, of course, when you take a step back and think about the broader treatment arc, um, you know, you have oncologists and palliative care people, our, our ancillary uh, colleagues in radiology and pathology, the anesthesia and nursing staffs, audiologists, and goes on and on. Um, and so I, I like to think about the sort of practice of skull base as, as being more about creative problem solving. And because the diseases and the patients are so heterogeneous, it, it really proves a point that we see, you know, again and again in medicine and in society that having a diversity of backgrounds and perspectives is really key. And, you know, in many ways, I think skull base, it's the original individualized medicine. And I think that's why there's so much innovation in the, the research and the technology that we see in this niche. And it's certainly one of my favorite things about the, the field. And again, this can bring us to, you know, what, what's the why of skull base? Well, that really is still the patients. And most of these people who, who come to, you know, someone's practice end up there because they're symptomatic. And, you know, one of the most important questions is, can we help them? And even if we're not able to relieve their symptoms or their symptoms are, re symptoms are relatively mild, we may be able to help uh, avoid a bad outcome down the road in terms of morbidity and mortality. And that's a really important parallel consideration. And then for yourself, not only is there consideration for each individual patient and how you can help them, but sort of the broader arc of, you know, uh, I've gone through my residency thinking, how can I, how can I take each uh, patient who I, I have the privilege to help take care of and, and learn from that and become a better surgeon and a better doctor down the road? And so the, the big why here, of course, like in so many aspects of medicine, is to really meaningfully improve the lives of our patients. So getting a little bit more technical and a little bit more into the nuances of skull-based surgery, when we start asking, you know, what? We're trying to make a definition. So one is it's, it's a comprehensive set of complex cranial uh, tools and techniques. That's pretty good. Um, but what I like even better is it's a modular system of bone removal strategies designed to maximize access while minimizing brain retraction. I think Dr. Van Gompel had told me that at some point that, you know, when thinking about how skull-based surgery was invented, that, you know, some, uh, an earlier generation of surgeons was noticing that some of the fixed retractors were causing a variety of deficits. And could we creatively think about removing bone in a certain sense to um, you know, open new access corridors that would give you the same uh, efficient, effective uh, tumor removal strategy without, you know, subjecting patients to increased deficits. But thinking broadly, there's a lot of non-operative stuff that goes into the care of, of managing skull-based patients as well. And so I think you could even expand this definition to say that it's, you know, skull-based surgery, it's a modular system of treatment strategies that are designed to maximize disease control while minimizing treatment morbidity. Or I even really like to kind of call it just, it's a problem-solving philosophy and, and one that I, I really love thinking about. So again, taking a step towards the more um, sort of technical aspect of things, this is why we're all really here today, and sort of the wear of skull base surgery. And we all start out thinking about the skull base in terms of these three cranial fosses, anterior, middle, posterior, which is intuitive, it's logical, it's easy, um, but it's limited in a certain sense. It's not very granular. Most uh, lesions don't respect those boundaries. A lot of them will be in two or even three fosses, so to speak. And when you're trying to have a conversation with someone about um, the approach you're planning or where you need to get, not having more nuanced language uh, is limiting. And so, you know, as you uh, study and advance and start thinking about things in a more detailed way, um, the 3D perspective is to, to develop uh, an understanding of the relationships between lesions and the structures that are nearby, uh, things like the tentorium or the venous sinuses. And, you know, our group has come up with this idea of uh, approach groups, which is basically saying you can put some of these skull-based approaches in dialogue with each other and say, um, rather than, you know, trying to leap all the way to saying, well, this is where the lesion is, and I'm going to, you know, establish this corridor using this bone removal technique, to think about a little bit more outside in as a learner to try and figure out, well, what general region am I going to be working in, and what are the, the different options there, and what the nuances between them. Now, obviously, we're all trying to get to the level of having like true 3D understanding and you know, sort of the skull-based logic and much more continuity in terms of your visualization between the lesion and the approach and to be less rigid about, you know, thinking about approaches and more fluid in terms of thinking about access and corridors. And I really like this expression that, you know, the goal is to, to figure out what for any given patient is going to give you all the access you need and none of the access you don't. So you're going to be uh, efficient and effective and, and minimize risk to the patient, which is, of course, the most important thing. And so this brings us to our, our last and our most important question that we're focusing on today, which is, is how to learn skull-based surgery. 
And so again, we put together these groups that we're going to uh, go through in a second here, which really this is an organizational strategy. And as I mentioned in practice, you know, the actual lesion, the target is what's going to dictate the surgical plan. But when you're a learner, you need to figure out how to understand the approaches before you can intuitively, you know, jump all the way to letting the, the target dictate the plan. And, you know, we like to say you can't aim a gun you don't know how to hold. And so this is to sort of introduce you to, you know, picking up the, the gun for the first time in a certain sense. We've clustered them by technical similarities and that has two benefits. One of them is within any particular group, you can examine um, okay, what's the difference between approach A and B? And then once you feel like you have an understanding of a group, you can say, okay, this group versus another group, what are the relative differences? And then sort of separately, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, how do you build your, your mental resources in terms of thinking like a skull-based surgeon? And we're going to talk a little bit about some of these approach-oriented dissections we put together and some of the novel resources we're building to help accelerate that process. And this is, it's, it's an evolution in your thinking to, again, get from you know, the guy who's focused on, I've got my three fossas and I kind of know what I'm doing um, to, you know, a slightly higher level uh, of organization. And again, each of these groups is, this is a shorthand and any uh, approach you could see in here doesn't uh, just give you access to that one particular area. There's a lot of diversity. So you could say with the, the ventral midline group, um, you know, one interesting thing within the group is like, okay, is this a, a lesion we could consider doing through a limited transpenoidal or an expanded endonasal, do we really need to go for the, the big bifrontal? And, you know, we all know you could use a, a, an endoscopic endonasal approach to do all, all kinds of amazing things inside the head, not just, you know, uh, anterior fossa, middle fossa stuff, but um, it's helpful to kind of put those together and compare them, for example, then to, say, the frontotemporal group. And within this group, you could say, okay, is this a lesion where um, the frontotemporal craniotomy on its own is going to be adequate? Do we need to go for its, you know, big boy cousin and, and without the OZ? Or is this a, a smaller, you know, uh, lateral sphenoid wing lesion where one of the minimally invasive cousins might apply? Um, you know, we're, we've organized these to uh, teach points like, well, what is really the difference between the sort of graduated going from a subtemporal to a middle fossa, going from a middle fossa to an anterior putrosectomy, and how are all of those distinct from uh, working in the labyrinthine space or the uh, retrolabyrinthine presigmoid space that you get with this presigmoid group, which is really the, the transpetrosal approaches um, for the most part. And then finally, the, the suboccipital group has sort of the most familiar approaches to a lot of more junior residents, but you know, it's still important to think about what are the distinctions here between the, the, those individual approaches and, and them as a group and the others. And you know, this is, this is a rigid way of thinking about things it's, again, we're, we're trying to get past that eventually, but it's, you need some sort of uh, architecture or organizing structure to be able to put the pieces together in your mind. And there's even more adaptations, and we're, we're not going to go through this in detail right here, but, you know, just in the back of your head to think about, you know, there's a frontotemporal craniotomy, but there's also that with an anterior clinoidectomy or with an orbital osteotomy or with both of those. There's a lot of different ways in which these are, these are varied. And where we really want to do is to be able to not be thinking about this, you know, rigidly in terms of boxes and lists, but thinking of it more as a, a, a continuous spectrum between, um, you know, again, a lesion corridor approach. These are beautiful illustrations from Dr. Jean's book that, you know, kind of highlight where, where you want to get to with things. And ideally, the highest level of thought is, is to get that sort of Zen, you know, skull-based space where you're just thinking about that modular bone removal you're going to do, but you can't leap right there, you know, you can't walk before you crawl. And so um, I want to take a little bit of a sidebar here and in that same spirit, talk about, you know, why does pedagogy matter? Why, why do we think that these ideas about learning and teaching how to learn and, and teaching how to teach matter? Part of that is that, you know, the complex cranial OR training has, has become more limited over time. You know, it's ultimately a, it's a small fraction of what most people do in their residency, and that's appropriate because it's a small fraction of, of neurosurgery practice in general. And when you add to that the impacts of things like duty hours, case volumes, um, you know, new technologies that have meant some people don't need a skull-based surgery and that's better for them. They're going to have a better outcome, but it still means fewer cases available. You know, we're training in a different environment than uh, the generation before us did. And we need to be creative about coming up with resources to help the generation that comes after us, you know, accelerate their own learning. And, you know, the next question this invites is, of course, well, there's a lot of resources out there. What are, what are you doing that's different and that might be more interesting? Now, we all know Dr. Roten's uh, dissections are absolutely incredible. Not a day goes by where I, I don't open one of them to, to look something up or to, to you know, just read. Um, I think they're phenomenal. And I don't think there's a neurosurgeon who hasn't benefited from his work practicing today. Um, 
they quintessentially, he, he talked a lot about trying to develop this 3D x-ray vision, um, which is absolutely incredible and needed that, you know, when you're looking at a particular structure in the OR, you want to be able to imagine what's on the other side of it and what's next to it and what's beyond that. What are all the things you can't see? So a lot of those dissections show you things that you can't see in surgery, which is incredibly useful for developing yourself and developing your mind's eye. But at the same time, when you're trying to learn just step by step, what am I doing tomorrow? And how am I going to get through this approach? And how do these pieces fit together in practical terms? There's there some limitations. There are great operative atlas, as we alluded to earlier, Dr. Myers, Dr. Twos. Um, those tend to be based on illustrations, though. And there is certainly value to having the, the cadavers or you know, dissections that are, that are giving you a little bit sort of finer layer of granularity in terms of what you're actually going to see in surgery. Um, atlases like Dr. Fukushima's atlas uh, split the difference. But those are also oftentimes written at such a high level that they're more, you know, I, I still sometimes find myself uh, a little bit, you know, struggling to understand some of that. And it's uh, a thing I think about and read about every day. So we, we really wanted to focus more on the, the junior level understanding to figure out, can we, you know, put tools in the hands of people who need them the most? Um, cadaver labs and training courses are obviously, you know, th there's nothing that, that I've done or anyone on our team has done that I think has helped us as much as just going to the lab and going through these approaches and writing these papers and things. But um, you know, not everyone has that resource available, and not everyone who has the resource available has the time to use it. And these days, I mean, no one's going to training courses with COVID. I mean, we're, we're hoping that that's all going to come back at some point, but we don't know when. And even if it does, you, you need more than just you know, one course every year or every couple of years to be able to you know, develop yourself robustly as, as a surgeon in training. And so in learning to think like a skull-based surgeon, what we're really talking about is trying to, again, streamline that evolution from, from getting to, to Po to Shifu and, and beyond. And, you know, this is hard stuff. Like tackling approaches, is, it's challenging. It's intimidating. I, I still think about this every day, and I'm still learning about this every day. And, and that's why it's been such a, an area of interest for, you know, me and Avital and Lucas and the other people we've worked with to, to try and be innovative about how can we develop new resources. And this is sort of the thing that we've been tackling with with Maria the most to um, how can we take the dissections, for example, and write these papers that are approach-oriented walkthroughs. So someone could take one of those and ideally bring it to the lab and do the dissection themselves um, if they don't have a training course, if they don't have someone who you know, has the time to walk them through it. Um, or at least if they can't go to the lab, they can take the paper with them to the OR, they can read it the night beforehand and, and get some sort of practical insight into what the, the case is actually gonna involve for them. And then separately, we're working on some non-cadaver based systems, either, again, for people who don't have access to that resource or just as a supplement, because it's a different kind of knowledge, it's a different space for your brain to work in. And that's both virtual reality spaces and um, 3D printed spaces. And to give you an example here, so this is a set of uh, tumors that we've printed inside heads with the craniotomies already completed. So the top row here, these are both retrosigmoid craniotomies. I'm sorry, I oriented these uh, orthogonal to each other. It's a little bit confusing, but um, so these are two retrosigmoids. This is a retrosigmoid versus a posterior petrosectomy, both with the same, the color is different, but it's the same uh, conformation of a vestibular schwannoma. And then here's a large trigeminal schwannoma. And the concept here is you could hand, let's say these two models with the lesion in them to a junior resident and say, this is like the case we're doing tomorrow. Which approach do you think we should use and why? Or can you show me how to position this head? Or can you talk to me about, you know, what did we have to do to get to this? You know, what's the, what are the steps or the, the bone removal strategies that are needed here? And we really think that there's, there's something to the physical model and being able to hold something like this in your hand that you know, you're investing concepts with a 3D sensibility. And we think that that's very useful as a teaching tool. Um, we're working on it also as a testing tool. And then we've developed sort of parallel models where these same uh, structures are available in a, in a 3D space, something like a VR or you know, virtual reality, augmented reality. And we're, you know, we're studying this. We've got preliminary results that are very promising in sort of observational series. We want to actually randomize it this year. And we're pretty excited about this being a, a really useful tool to, again, help accelerate that timeline in your learning about you know, how to think like a skull-based surgeon. This is sort of the most advanced model we've got going on. And this is um, a drillable model. We can do whole heads with these. We did some temporal bones just for uh, efficiency's sake here. But so in this particular example, you take a CT scan and you segment out you know, bone, semicircular canals, IAC, geniculate and facial nerve here. And what that lets you do is in addition to making a temporal bone model, you can take those inner structures and say, okay, I want to make the facial nerve green and I want to make the membranous labyrinth blue. 
um, and I want to put the otic capsule bone outside them in yellow, and then I want to take that and put it in the anatomically correct location inside that temple bone model. And then what that means is you could hand this to someone who's learning how to do, uh, you know, say a posterior petrosectomy, and say you're going to take this and you're going to go to the lab, and I want you to drill out your mastoid, and I want you to show me the yellow, so to speak, you know, identify and skeletonize the otic capsule bone, um, but not the green. And then if they handed you this at the end, you could say, hey, you did a great job. You found the facial nerve. I've got you, I see your horizontal canal and superior and posterior canals, but there's a little spot of green here. You might've caused a facial nerve injury. And so this gives you, you know, direct real time feedback um, that we think is gonna be very, very useful in terms of both getting someone comfortable with the steps of the procedure before they you know, do it for the first time in surgery, even using this as an, as an adjunct to, to lab time. To, you, know, this, you don't need the same wet lab resources to do this in a cadaver. It can introduce you to the concept before you do that. So to kind of put all of these ideas and concepts into play, I think it's a lot more um, understandable if we actually you know, start talking about a specific case. So we're gonna look at, um, this is a 20 year old gentleman from Lipscomb, Iowa, this you know, beautiful pastoral scene here, classic Midwestern visages. Um, and he has a history of an intermediate grade glioma when he's 13 years old, uh, underwent a left posterior temporal lobe lesion resection subtotal at an outside hospital, went on standard protocol at that point, about temozolomide and about a 60 gray IMRT treatment. And overall, he's done very well since then. He's uh, undergone routine MRI surveillance um, with no active issues, you know, he's doing quite well. This is just an example of one of his surveillance scans. You can see the resection cavity here. No major evidence of, of recurrence or anything else really concerning on here. And then this is a, this is a stock photo, but uh, you know, he comes into the, the clinic or the ER rather. Um, you know, this is a representative. He's got you know, new right-sided facial weakness and um, some arm and leg weakness, in coordination, headache, an updated MRI is recommended, and he's uh, ultimately recommended or referred to, to Dr. Ling's practice. And that's because that's what we was seen on that updated MRI is this really large central pontine um, expansile lesion here, internally heterogeneous sort of salt and pepper coloration. Um, you know, most of you will recognize this is almost certainly a cavernoma. And looking back at you know that slice I showed you a second ago, there's a little spot here that may have been an early indication of something brewing under there. Um, and so most likely with that history of the low-grade glioma and the 60 gray IMRT treatment, this is probably a radiation-induced cavernous malformation that has since been complicated by, by hemorrhages. And so the recommendation, of course, is surgical resection. And in fact, while he's awaiting surgery, uh, he has another bleeding event, develops some cranial neuropathy, his diplopia, disconjugate gaze, dysphagia. And you know, to sort of talk a little bit now about, again, this you know, skull-based thinking, skull-based logic, how to think like a skull-based surgeon. We want to break down, you know, what are the key features of this lesion? What are patient factors that might influence our decision? What are the options for um, the approaches here? And what are the risks and benefits? And so in terms of the lesion itself, like I said, we're talking about how this is a large, expansive, central pontine lesion. And we're really talking about, this is pretty strictly a posterior fossa tumor. And if you look, it comes pretty close to the surface at the left lateral aspect of the pons, adjacent to the middle cerebellar peduncle. If you compare this side to the contralateral, you see the IAC, and that's right around where the root entry zone for seven and eight are. So that's our target surgically in terms of, you know, where are we gonna be able to most safely um, get to this thing? And, you know, what about, uh, you know, patient factors? So this is, you know, it's a really big lesion. It's symptomatic, it's progressive. He's had multiple hemorrhagic events and this is quite dangerous in terms of being a potentially life-threatening or limb-threatening entity. And, you know, this is also, he's 20 years old, so he's young. He's got uh, many, many years of, of life and quality of life ahead of him. He's otherwise medically fit with a very good prognosis. Uh, and there aren't really other treatment alternatives that, that would be discussed, certainly not for something this large or a lesion of this nature. And, you know, he's, he's interested in surgery. He's got a very good support system. So all of that, you know, sort of sums to, again, the, the, the primary recommendation here is surgery. And just as a footnote, I'll mention that, you know, when he, he saw Dr. Link, his hearing was prever preserved. And that's something that we're going to put into play when we start breaking down what are our options for approaches to consider. So as I said, this is really, it's a posterior fossil lesion. So we're talking about from the approach groups, things that would fall into either the suboccipital group or the pre-sigmoid group. Now, I think most people, uh, myself included, when you, you first look at this, your instinct is probably to think retrosigmoid, which is a great option. You know, it gives you this sort of a trajectory, gets right to that spot we were talking about. 
Um, it's the workhorse for a lot of posterior fossa surgery, uh, neurosurgery, and um, you know, it's simple, straightforward, uh, very effective. So that's obviously on the list. What about far lateral? Uh, so a far lateral is a little bit lower in terms of the access you get, you know, it opens up the foramen magnum. Depending on how you do it, it might be a little bit more limited superiorly. So when we're thinking about a central pontine lesion, it might actually be more limited and it's at a minimum, it's too much surgery. So that's probably not a great option to consider here. Now, some cavernomas in this location might be exophytic into the fourth ventricle. And so the midline suboccipital approach for some patients would be a reasonable consideration. But here we can see there's, there's a rind of fourth ventricle flora there. And so accessing you know, through the fourth ventricle would potentially be a very morbid way to, to tackle this. So that's, that's another poor choice. Um, in terms of the pre-sigmoid approaches, those, those fall into sort of two larger subgroups. There's the, the hearing preserving posterior petrosectomy, which gives you a, a somewhat more you know, lateral approach. And we're gonna look at that in a little bit more detail in a, a moment here. But you know, for this guy who's got preserved hearing, it's a reasonable option and uh, certainly warrants consideration as an alternative to the retrosig here. Um, but because he does have hearing preserved, the translab um, and its, its cousin, you know, the transodic, transcochlear, extended translab, et cetera, those are all probably poor choices. You know, he's while young, he wants to keep his hearing if possible. Um, and you know, the translab is a great approach. In someone who has lost hearing, it's, it's very fast. Uh, it has less risk of things like you know, CSF leak or you know, uh, certain uh, other uncommon complications compared to the putrosectomy. Um, but it's obviously, it's not a great choice here for this guy. So what we're really gonna focus on is making the decision between a retrosig and a posterior putrosectomy for this patient. And that's a nuanced decision. And you know, again, the retrosig, it's, it's familiar. We know it, we love it. It gives you really reliable, wide uh, CP angle access. Um, this is about what that trajectory would look like. And you know, the one uh, point I'll make is that you know, the deep reach, especially getting to that ventral midbrain or working laterally here, it could potentially be limited, again, depending on the, the configuration of a patient's um, you know, Peter's temporal bone by that angle, because you're not gonna be able to get more anterior than where the, the sigmoid is fixated to the bone there. The posterior petrosectomy, by contrast, you're working in the space in between the sigmoid sinus and the labyrinth, um, and it gives you this more lateral angulation to that same ventral brainstem region. So you have a little bit more of a straight shot and a little bit of a shorter reach, and it's a, it's a wide open exposure, so you have a little bit more light in. So it has some advantages for working in this location with the understanding that it also um, it's a longer exposure. It's going to take more of your day. It's got an increased risk of CSF leak. And even though it's technically a hearing preserving surgery, as is the retroseg, um, it does have a slightly increased risk of hearing loss relative to the retrosigmoid craniotomy. So it is something else important to keep in mind and to counsel people about. So overall, it's an uncommonly used approach, but it, it is preferred in, in some select cases. And you know, in Dr. Link's uh, practice, for every eight retrosigs, about there is you know one time that maybe a posterior petrosectomy would be the preferred approach, um, which is ultimately what was recommended in this case. And we'll come back to that in a minute here. Um, but to talk again about the idea of uh, you know learning skull base and learning how to think like a skull base surgeon, um, you know what is a posterior petrosectomy? There might there might be a lot of people listening to this, particularly at the medical student level or junior resident level, who who haven't seen one. And so these are figures taken from uh, you know, our first paper in this series that we've been working on of showing you know, sort of approach-oriented dissections to kind of walk people step-by-step step through the anatomy of how to do these approaches. And you know, again, to try to help people shorten that timeline in their own evolution, in their own understanding, their own learning. So patients are positioned lateral for this. Um, it's tough to see the, the actual positioning from the head alone, but uh, trust me on that, you try to put the superior sagittal sinus roughly parallel to the floor. And you can see here projected on the skull, this is about where the transverse and sigmoid sinuses are. Um, and you use a large curvilinear incision, starts from the root of the zygoma, goes about three finger breaths above the pinna and curves down into a neck crease. You take the scalp flap up with a fascial layer, leaving down your temporalis muscle, occipitalis muscle, and sternocleidomastoid. And one that making two cuts in this, one here at about where temporalis and occipitalis come together, and one here below SCM in a way that would allow you to um, have a cuff to, to close the posterior fossa aspect of this upward at the end. And these are what those three muscle cuffs look like once you've elevated them. You can see your nice bony landmarks here and we've again projected on the surface about where we would think the uh, sigmoid and transverse sinuses are based on superficial landmarks. So then we gotta make some burr holes, put one here at the root of the zygoma 
another here below the STL, sort of close to the top of um, the exposure below our cuff. And then this close-up here shows the sort of two more difficult burr holes. One of them is at the posterior aspect of the exposure overlying the transverse sinus. And what's really key here is to get both above and below the sinus so you can really safely dissect the sinus off the inner table of the, the skull. And then um, fully exposing the transverse sigmoid junction here a little bit more laterally. And the key here is to make sure that you've got the sinodural angle exposed so that you do get down to dura so you can both strip the middle fossa dura here and again, get across the sinus the whole way before you try to pull this bone flap up so you reduce the risk of injury to the veins as much as possible here. Then you can run your foot plate after you've made the trough over the sigmoid sinus, connect your burr holes the rest of the way, and hopefully you've done a good job um, you know, stripping here, but it's very, very common when you elevate the bone flap to find a small vein here that bleeds somewhat briskly uh, because of the you know, uh, amount of venous blood coming through this area that oftentimes needs to be uh, controlled, for example, with um, a 4 L proline suture in a figure eight fashion, a little gel foam while you're getting that all set up, but that's just something to have up on the table and ready when you're working on the bone flap. And then usually the ENT team will take over here. Uh, we'll start working on the mastoidectomy. Uh, you can do a lot of this with a large cutting burr, first taking off the cortical bone, and then widely saucerizing the mastoid. And hopefully down to the level of, you might see uh, in a lot of specimens, this thing called the Kerner septum, which is sort of the last bony bridge before you pop into the mastoid antrum, which is where all of those air cells are coalescing into the middle ear. And that's where things get interesting. That's where you can start to see the short process of the incus, which is pointing towards the incus buttress and is a really important landmark for identifying where the facial nerve is gonna be under here. And in the floor of the antrum, you can see this horizontal semicircular canal. And so then you just slowly stepwise are removing more and more of those air cells, skeletonizing the otic capsule bone of the semicircular canals, first the horizontal and the posterior, eventually the superior. And as you proceed, more of the um, ossicles, more of the facial nerve comes into clear relief. Here you can see that uh, second genu, the facial nerve nicely. Um, we're you know, more nicely sculpting and skeletonizing the semicircular canals as we go stepwise. And we're doing this with ideally the bone left in place on top of the uh, sigmoid sinus. That's so that the, the ENT docs who are, who are actually doing this work can be a little bit more efficient about things. Uh, you, know, you can drill faster when you don't have to worry about causing a big venous injury right there. And so then right before we decompress the sinus, this is what things look like. Facial nerve, wide mastoidectomy, semicircular canals identified take off that last little layer of bone and you're staring at the dura of Troutman's triangle here, which is bounded by, you've got the jugular bulb, the sigmoid, and just out of view underneath here, the superior petrosal sinus. You can see the endolymphatic sac nicely under this dissector here. And then you gotta open the dura. And uh, so typically you would do um, a linear incision just along the sigmoid first, leaving a small cuff of dura there to close to. And as you come across the endolymphatic sac, you have to throw a stitch in that. Usually we'd use a, like a 3 silk in a figure eight fashion, and that's to prevent the endolip from escaping, which um, if it did, or if you suctioned on that, could end up leading to hearing loss. And then two parallel cuts on either side of Troutman's triangle here to give you this trap door of posterior fossa access. Then along the, the temporal lobe inferiorly, first you're gonna open kind of at the, the edge of the, the junction here, in hopes of identifying the vein of LeBay, where it's going into the uh, intradural aspect of the junction or the transverse sinus, then that absolutely needs to be protected. And then you can kind of see these arrows show the direction. After you've opened this a little bit, you can do the sort of long linear cut subtemporally here, and then back to basically as far as you can get safely, um, allowing for whatever the confirmation of veins is underneath there. Once the dura is open and this is retracted about your way, you can work your way subtemporally over to the incisura with the hope of finding the fourth nerve. And the fourth nerve inserts into the tentorium, usually somewhat anterior to the sort of main uh, access corridor for this particular approach, but you really wanna see it because some people would have it a little bit more posterior and you wanna make sure that you're um, protecting it. And that when you're gonna make your cut across the tentorium here, that that's not gonna be involved or injured. And then you can plan your incision safely. And this is oftentimes, since you're coming across the superior petrosal sinus, uh, it can be a quite bloody experience. Um, sometimes bipolaring and cutting is sufficient, but oftentimes you need wet clips available to, to make your way you know, safely and progressively across the tentorium. Um, and once you've got the tentorium fully uh, you know, opened up, 
and retract it out of your way. You can put in your subtemporal retractor and your cerebellar retractor, and this is your final exposure. And um, you know, it's a beautiful approach, like we were talking about before. It gives you this really ventral access to the brain stem through a lateral corridor, very wide open, short working distance, um, very a uh, lot of light in. And you can th th this doesn't show perfectly, but you know if you look at the paper, you can see this. You can get really from 11 to 3 pretty effectively with this. Um, and just a few more detail shots here. You, know, you nicely can see obviously seven and eight complex, um, fifth cranial nerve here, a lot of the cerebrovasculature, intermediates between seven and eight if you, if you pull eight out of the way a little bit, and the labyrinthine artery off of the nyca loop. So that's how you do a posterior petrosectomy. Hopefully the you know, step by step dissection is helpful. Um, check out the paper at some point. I'm happy to, you know, if anyone has questions about that, answer those offline later. Um, but let's get back to our patient. So this again here is, you know, we had talked about, would we consider a retrosigmoid? Would it give you this kind of an angle? Which would certainly get you where you want to be, but you think about this plane posteriorly, it's going to take quite a bit of retraction and it's not really an ideal working angle. Whereas if you think about coming in from that lateral trajectory we just saw in the dissection, that really opens things up a lot more and you're, you have less retractions to do, you're looking straight into the heart of the lesion. And that's what, um, you know, Dr. Lang did for this particular case. And you can see here the post-op films, uh, was a really excellent gross total resection. And that little CSF cleft from where the lesion had been aligns perfectly with the trajectory that you get from the exposure. So this demonstrates really nicely the sort of ideal application of an approach like this. And there's a post-op CT scan, which again kind of highlights that you're getting right up to the edge of that otic capsule bone and trying to work you know, at this uh, lateral corridor here. Um, into the, the ventral brain stem. And these are just a couple quick uh, intraoperative shots. This is again the seventh and eighth nerve, making a small uh, superior to inferior cordisectomy here. Um, you know, really a tiny working window to be able to get out that uh, entire lesion is all that was needed um, you know, for Dr. Link in this circumstance. And this is the cavity at the eighth end, again, you know, sort of highlighting gross total resection and uh, really an excellent job through a, a really uh, fantastic application of this particular um, approach. So this guy, uh, after surgery, he woke essentially at his pre-op baseline. He did have some mild uh, facial numbness without dysesthesias on that side, but no other new deficits. Um, over you know, uh, days to weeks, he had resolution and improvement in all of the cranial neuropathies and other symptoms he had beforehand. Um, and his hearing was preserved, so no long-term hearing deficits. And he's more than five years out from surgery now, uh, neurologically stable, radiographically following, doing great. So um, again, really a great clinical application of that. So that, you know, I, I think gives you a taste for what we're, we're shooting for with this, um, you know, skull basics uh, concept. And, you know, so just to sort of wrap things up a little bit here, I know we're uh, getting short on time. Um, you know, the, the main goal here is kind of talk about the principles and philosophies of skull-based surgery with, you know, things like emphasizing the focus on patients, on teamwork, on self-improvement. And that this is essentially a world that is, it's essentially, um, it's about modularity, about creativity, about, you know, problem-solving philosophies, both in the OR and outside of the OR. And again, I really like this expression, all the access you need, none that you don't. Um, but you have to get there. And, you know, I'm still working every day. Our team is still working every day to, to improve our own understanding and to get ourselves to a place where, um, you know, we're able to, uh, you know, understand more of that higher level, uh, how do you use the approaches and how do you get to just the modular bone removal aspect of things, not just rigid categorization of approaches, but you need to start from somewhere. And we like this idea of starting with these, these approach groups. Um, and having, you know, step-by-step -step guides and dissections is sort of um, the next step in the, you know, resources that we're trying to put in people's hands to, to advance things. Um, and then, and as I showed briefly earlier, these 3D models, uh, drillable models, other, you know, uh, VR and AR applications, things that we're hopeful long-term will be, um, you know, helpful to, to education. So the next one of these that we're going to do, uh, we'll you know sort of take a deep dive on the first of the approach groups, the suboccipital group, really to focus on both. You know, we walked through the petrosectomy today to walk through how do you do a retroseg, how do you do a far lateral, how do you do a midline suboccipital, and what are the differences inside of that group between them, and again to really emphasize these questions about you know how do you how do you learn how to do skull base surgery, how do you learn the approach selection principles, and this is I think um, a really nice model for thinking about, you know, broader questions in, in optimizing treatment of people. Um, the timing, the other details are still being finalized. 
Um, if you're on tw Twitter, keep an eye on uh, my account, the Skull Basics account, or the Mayo Neurosurgery account. Um, you know, we'll announce that whenever we've got a date lined up. And then sort of the last point I want to emphasize here is that um, we'd love to hear feedback. So if there's anything uh, today that you thought, you know, could have been improved or something that we, we didn't include that, that you'd like to have highlighted in the future, you know, more cases, more dissections, more, more talk about the principles, et cetera, um, please reach out to me on Twitter or uh, via email um, and we will do what we can to kind of keep improving things as we move along. And then finally, I need to give uh, uh, one last shout out again. Um, none of this would have been possible without the incredible mentorship I've had, um, you know, from Dr. Link, the incredible, uh, I have wonderful research partners. It is so fun to work with Avital and Lucas, and it's, um, you know, it's been amazing to watch Avital finish her fellowship and graduate, and I'm so proud of all the work that we've done together and all the work we're going to keep doing together. Um, Dr. Jay Morris from Radiology has, has been a champion of mine, and he's really taken me under his wing, teaching me a lot of the 3D printing and 3D modeling stuff, and I'm very grateful to him for, you know, kind of welcoming me into his world. And then, of course, I, I can't say enough things about Maria, who has been such a role model and an inspiration to all of us, and she's taught us so much. And, um, you know, she's going to be a giant in skull base surgery, and I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to have, you know, uh, been in her, uh, you know, aura early on and, and learned from her all of these sort of Rotan techniques. So that wraps things up for the skull basics portion of this. I'm going to spend just a couple minutes here highlighting the upcoming Mayo Neurosurgery uh, virtual sub eye. Um, so there's a few different experiences that are planned and a couple different places you can go for more information on that in the future. This is really for the medical students who are tuning in. Uh, the first thing that's being planned is this autumn lecture series. So this is going to launch not this coming Saturday, but the following Saturday. That's uh, August 22nd. Um, and it's going to be about a three-month cycle of these core neurosurgery talks led by our, our staff and our residents um, pretty much every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. We tried to pick a time that would um, be conducive to getting the, the West Coast crew on board without, put, without putting it so late in the day that it's you know, uh, hard to get a lot of uh, participation from the East Coast as well, try to be as representative and inclusive as possible. And we're going to cover a wide range of topics. Um, you know, everything you need to know as a junior resident, you know, traumatic brain injury, neurocritical care, supervascular stuff, neurolog, spine, etc. As I said, it's really geared towards a, a fourth year uh, audience, um, but they're going to be open to the public. So, you know, if you found today interesting, you might find these interesting. Um, if you are applying this year, if possible, it would be ideal to attend live. But if that's not possible, um, just like today, uh, we will put these on, on the website um, and it'll be uh, you know, available for you to review. So you still get a sense for who are we and who are our, our staff and our residents and you know, what kind of educational experience do we have to offer here. Um, there are going to be some social events as well, you know, the proverbial Zoom cocktail hour, I guess. And uh, those, again, we'll, we'll get those announced on, on Twitter, Instagram, website, et cetera. Um, these are our PGY-5s, uh, Lucas Karlstrom, Megan Everson, and Cody Nesvik. They're really leading the charge on organizing all of these events. So they're the people to, to reach out to if you have specific questions or if you want to, um, you know, uh, be a little bit more sort of uh, in the know on things. We put together a, a few different online outlets for uh, disseminating information. One of them is this website, mayoneurosurgery.org. Pretty much everything is going to be uh, included on there redundantly. Then there's, you know, our Twitter and our Instagram accounts and enlisted here. We also have a YouTube channel, um, which we think is going to include, you know, a good amount. Basically, any of these videos, um, the one that I'm giving right now, we'll post there. We've got a handful of them up there already. Um, a few of our residents have given short ones on things like Take and Call or uh, the microvascular lab or the skull base lab that we have available. I gave one um, sort of like a 10 minute thing on why I think that this is uh, the greatest neurosurgery training program in the world that I hope you'll check out at some point if you're thinking about applying this year. And then sort of I'll, I'll stop here. Um, you know, this is the contact information for our program director, uh, Dr. Van Gompel, our APDs, Dr. Daniels and Dr. Elder, our EPCs, Katie Millard and Corey Scogan. Um, they are, again, the, the best people to reach out to for, you know, administrative questions or um, if you have, you know, questions you want to put to one of the staff rather than a resident. Um, and I, yeah, I think that's, that's most of what I have to say today. I'm going to take a quick peek here at the, the chat box just to make sure that there isn't uh, anything that we need to talk about before we sign off here. Um, so will a recording of the seminar be available? Yes, absolutely. It'll be on the YouTube channel and our website. How does the 3D printed bone respond to dr drilling compared to bone? That's a great question, Tony. 
Um, it's uh, not quite the same feel, but we've been working on these like uh, bond injected and wax injected models that are getting more and more realistic. So right now I'd say we're probably 60, 70% the way there. So it's, uh, I think that we've got something that feels close enough to drilling bone that it's, it's worth spending the time actually doing it in a lab under a scope. The earlier models would just melt away. Um, we're hoping to continue refining that long term, but that's, that's a really important sort of goal of things overall. Um, then a couple very nice uh, shout outs. Thanks, guys. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, IMGs are welcome to attend the virtual sub I. Um, like I said, those are going to be uh, publicly hosted, so anyone who wants to, to tune into those can. There are going to be some events that are specific for applicants. Um, you know, the information on sort of what's available to whom will be on the website or on the Twitter, um, but there will be some things that are that are open to all because, you know, we, we obviously want the whole world to know about what we think is such a great program. So, um, and there's people who aren't applying this year who we want to learn about it for, for further years down the road. Um, so I think that's it in terms of the questions. Again, thank you everyone. Uh, it was an honor to represent uh, Mayo and our training program today. Um, it was a lot of fun to do this. Uh, and again, if you have any questions um, about the Skull Basics stuff, uh, you're welcome to reach out to me on, on Twitter uh, or by email. And if you have questions about the program, check out the website or email any of these folks here. And um, have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>